Sorry it took so long. Dave me had back there had me back there with last night's cake. <laughs> so how the hell are you? It's great to see you, man. I'm good. I'm gonna pimp myself here, and I don't usually do this, but I'm getting old, and I, I have to tell everybody I've had a, a 2013 was a phenomenal year for me. It was my 40th uh, year in Hollywood show business. Wow. I starred in my first movie in 1973, and uh, last year I was asked to star with Finn Jones from Game of Thrones and Emily Barrington from The White Queen in a great little thriller in England uh, directed by uh, Phil Hawkins, who was Spielberg's protege on the reality show The Lot. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's gonna be terrific. And I'm the old, Richard Attenborough, projectionist, nice. who gets, uh, what, what do they call it? Um, well, laid off here, or fired, or uh, made redundant, Let's as they go. say in the UK. And I have to work in the concession stand, shoveling popcorn until my retirement. And so I get, uh, uh, what do you call it, the camera, the Go Go, go. GoPro camera, and I use the, the hidden cameras in the movie theater in the Octoplex, and I, get, I go to Radio Shack and get my own camera, and I make my own midnight movie for revenge. And uh, it, it's really terrific, you guys. The point of views are beyond paranormal, beyond Blair Witch. Um, the cast is exciting, really good. You're gonna recognize lots of people. And, uh, and then I came back to the States, and because of fans like you, my friends, the great Robert Hall, who's now house director for Teen Wolf, who did Laid to Rest 1 and 2, who's been working in makeup effects since Buffy the goddamn Vampire Killer, <laughs> Rob and his team were able to Indiegogo the rest of the movie to make Fear Clinic. Now, I wish I could say that I'm the best thing in the movie because I work my ass off until Christmas Eve, but Thomas Decker from Terminator, Sarah Connor Chronicles, shreds it in this movie, right up to his lobotomy scar and his wheelchair, and it is nasty, and the guest makeup effects people were Robert Oscar-winning Kurtzman, the K in KNB, Wishmaster director, you guys, a hundred movies, that everything by Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino and Wes Craven, uh, he came on to help us at the last minute, and so did, out of retirement, out of Costa Rica, Steven Johnson, as in Hellboy, okay, one, two, okay, Steve Johnson came in, and it's gonna, it's gonna be, it's terrific. So, at the age of 67 years, I was able to star in two movies, two vehicles, and they're coming out, and they're both fan-generated for you guys, and they should be out this year. So, that's my pimporama. Uh, that's my answer to Dave's question. And now we should probably just go Q&A. Okay, we'll do as we always do. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Right here. Well, no, here's the thing you have to understand. I would love to do the prequel script, which is similar to the Toby Hooper episode of the television series. And it's been floating around for, you know, a dozen years now. John McNaughton was attached at one point. I like that, I heard the script is incredible. Actors do sequels. We don't do remakes. We ne actors don't do remakes. We do sequels, we do cameos, but we don't do remakes. Danny Glover and Mel Gibson are never gonna do Lethal Weapon 1 again. They might do Lethal Weapon 14, but they're never gonna do Lethal Weapon 1 again. 
I could do a prequel to Nightmare on Elm Street. I could do Freddy versus goddamn Chucky. But I can't do Nightmare 1 or Nightmare 2 again. They want to reboot the franchise. Time Warner, Platinum Dunes. Here's the thing, you guys. It's not a horrible thing. All the movies that our grandparents saw had all been silent films. They were all remade. This is something that Hollywood does. Why? Because there's only so many stories we can tell around the campfire. We're storytellers. I think what's happened in Hollywood is they prematurely ejaculated here on remakes. <laughs> the same people, the same people that are remaking things too fast are the people that spent money for Blu-ray, DVD, cable, Netflix. This is the same paradigm. And what they need to know is for the first time in history, good movies that don't do well on, on release or don't do well on their first uh, DVD release or cable showing, they have an opportunity to be discovered and you have legs on Blu-ray, on DVD, on Netflix, on cable reruns. And sooner or later, if they are good, they will be discovered. Whether it's Boondock Saints, whether it's Suicide Kings, whether it's uh, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, yeah. the Behind the Mask, yeah. these films will be discovered. And, and, and we have to give them time now. So the industry needs to know that they've made movies have legs and shelf life longer than any time in the history of films. Movies, there's great movies that were made in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s that are missing in action, MIA, and you have to seek them out, hopefully, on Turner or, or, or on your own research. There's some terrific stuff out there uh, that gets discovered, or movies that, that I vaguely remember seeing, you know, when I was 11 or 12. And, the, and, the, and, the, and we hope that, that somebody like me will fall in love with them and bring them out on DVD and, and, and put them on Cinemax every Saturday night for a year on cable, like they did for my, my business manager's movie, Suicide Kings, which is now a certifiable hit. And Quentin Tarantino saw and put it in a box set, along with Jackie Brown and Pulp Fiction. But, but this is why they have to just back off a little bit on the remix, let the re more recent films generate and, and discover the audience, or let the audience discover them. Okay, another question. In the early 80s, I'm gonna tell you I'm a really, really- In the early 80s, I had hair on all parts of my body. Yes, <laughs> and you were blonde and you looked Not great. just my ears, I'm sorry, what? And you were blonde and you looked great. How much fun did you have with the fan franchise V? Because I loved you in that. Well, you guys have to understand something about V. I I did V, and I turned down a great offer to go to Italy. And then I did Nightmare on Elm Street in my hiatus, in that period of time between the miniseries and the series. And then I started reacting to my fan mail from V. I think I did a convention in Atlanta, the big sci-fi convention. Uh, uh, Dragon Con? Dragon Con, yeah. Yeah, an early Dragon Con. But then I, I was so busy, I didn't realize this, and I turned down this trip to Italy. I went back, and I won Best Supporting Actor over Richard Chamberlain for The Thornbirds, something your mom's all like. Anyway, <laughs> it's so cute. Rachel Ward, Brian Brown's wife. Okay. Oh, it was such a soapy goddamn thing. Anyway, let's share the sheep and talk in an Australian accent. Hey. So anyway, um, I'm over there, and I, and I turned this down, right? And I go to the after party. Catherine Deneuve. Robert England, Fernando Ray, the French goddamn connection, and oh. Dust, Dustin Hoffman. Yes. That's my table. Woo. And I went, why, why, what, what, what am I thinking? You know, why did, and that was my first click onto the power of fans. I hadn't done Comic-Con yet. And what I realized was the Europeans, they were beyond that snob shit. They just embraced it. They loved science fiction. They loved horror. And they gave it an equal respect. 
as Westerns or to film noir or other sort of subgenres of films. And it was this enlightening moment of time to me. You know what it's like to be with Catherine Deneuve in 1985 and I've got the award she didn't win? At a table in Milan, Italy, across the street from La Scala Opera House, in a rented tuxedo. Oh my God! You know, I was, and, and that was. But you, you have to understand, there was such respect for genre already in Europe. They already respected it because they were starving for it. I mean, uh, let me tell you, some of you are metalheads, right? Some of you love, right? You should see in Italy. In Italy. Metal is elevated to such a prestige level. Nobody would ever make fun of it. We say metalhead now and it means a couple of things. You know, we know you're a fan of that genre, blah, 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 heavy metal, you know, rock and roll, all that. In, in Europe, there's no judgment. It's always part of it, like the cowboy movie, like the horror movie, like the science fiction, like the romantic comedy. There's no judgment. They love it. They respect it. And I was part of that with science fiction, and horror. I got in, and the, I, it was like just this great moment of time. So that was sort of my '80s revelation. That moment of time. The other, the other corresponding revelation. I, I, I think Dave knows about this. Uh, I'm not sure the name of this convention, but I did a science fiction convention in in New York uh, at the old Roosevelt Hotel on 47th Street. Ooh, in the Diamond District. I kept waiting for Laurence Olivier go to go. Is it safe? Is it safe? <laughs> a marathon man, right? And uh, it's raining and it's a crappy, shitty day. And I'm sitting there and Bob Shea, the head of New Line Cinema, comes in to take me out to lunch and I'm signing autographs with William Shatner. It's me and William Shatner. And I'm not that impressed by William Shatner yet because he hasn't done 20 Star Trek movies yet. And Star Trek's a little bit in the valley at this moment of time. And, but I love Bill Shatner from other things. And so I'm talking to Bill Shatner about his Rashomon film that he did with Paul Newman and Claire Bloom, who married Philip Roth and Rod Steiger, this extraordinary English actress who was Ophelia to Laurence Olivier's Hamlet. And I'm there and, and, and I'm telling him all this and he likes me and we're signing autographs. And Bob Shea comes in and he goes, Man, look at this Freddy Krueger. You're just, this Freddy Krueger's gone through the roof. And I go, what? And he goes, oh, this Freddy Krueger, man. We're into the money now, man. It's, I said, Bob, these are my V fans. I'm here for a science fiction convention. All these kids want to know about the plots of the new V episodes. And Bob goes, no, 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 no. They're here for, and I go, no, Bob. And I'm arguing, and I look out the window of the lobby of the Roosevelt Hotel on 47th and Madison in New York, Manhattan. You guys could all take a car up there right now. It's so close. And in the rain is a line, as far as I can see, of Ramones, punk rock, heavy metal fans in wet black leather, and girls with mohawks pierced and dog collars on. And they all want Freddie's autograph. <laughs> One print in New York and New Jersey being driven around to different theaters. And that's when I knew. That was the other 80s moment, along with the one in Milan, Italy, when I knew, hey, I'm on to something here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is nothing, you guys. He's talking about the little cartoon I draw. The real reason I draw it a lot, you guys, is because I'm old. I have arthritis, and it exercises my hand after I've written, you know, <laughs> after I've written to Brittany, eat shit, love Freddie, you know, a hundred times. <laughs> guys, I need, you know, and so I draw it, but I mean, you know, I'm not going to try to be a saint up here or anything like that. No, but where that happened was I was on a jury in Brussels. There's a great festival, you guys. And when I was young, Dave will remember this too, you could get great flights out of Newark and out of Buffalo to uh, Dublin and to Brussels because Brussels is the capital of Europe, the new Europe, the Euro and all that bullshit. So we, you know, when you're a young student, you would go there a lot. So I'm doing the Brussels Film Festival and Nancy and I are there for the second or third time and now I'm Mr. 
big dick on the jury, right? <laughs> me and Christopher Lee. No, it's me and Christopher Lee, the director of The Ring. Oh no, it's a it's a big deal. And we and like you're up at nine in the morning with 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 French coffee, which is good. And you watch movies with me and John Landis and Christopher Lee are watching Japanese horror before you guys ever heard about it. We're watching The Ring, point zero zero zero, you know? And we're watching Japanese Catholic schoolgirls, you know, rape a dog. Oh, unbelievable stuff, yeah. Just like the opening of the thing, you know? Oh my God, how do they do that? Is that an animatronic or what is that a practical effect? Anyway, so we're sitting there and Christopher Lee's going, I don't know if I approve of this. Back in the Hama days, it was so, and we're going, no, Chris, you're like, no, this is good. I've never seen anything like this. Then we would go out for this great lunch, this phenomenal lunch, you guys. I mean, awesome lunch. You know, the, the, the Belgians have to work harder. They have to try harder because they're not Parisians. So the food is incredible. So I'm out to lunch with, like, the, the guys that directed the early Bond films and Christopher Lee and everything. <clears throat> but in Brussels, who is their patron saint? Not Walt Disney. The guy that draws Tintin, Tonton, as we say if we're snobs. You guys saw the Spielberg movie. All the advertising in Belgium is in that cartoon style, that kind of simplistic Tintin cartoon style. So I started doing the Freddy Doodle for those fans in Belgium, and they loved it. They went ape shit over it. So I continue to do it and to exercise my arthritic, ar arthritic wrist after I've, I've signed Brittany and Heather 25 times. Next question. Back here. It's you. Is there any chance, is there any chance that yourself is amazing Freddy Krueger? Yourself and Johnny Depp are ever making a new Freddy movie together? No, look at Nobody in this room would rather work with Johnny again than this cowboy. I mean, Johnny is gold. That's like rubbing up against platinum, you guys. Um, you know, Lone Ranger notwithstanding. Um, come on. But uh, no, I would, I mean, you guys know, I, I, it's not like I, I don't know Johnny. I don't hang with Johnny. Uh, you know, Johnny was this beautiful baby-faced Elvis when I worked with him, and he was very rockabilly. And, 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 and I've told this story a million times, it's in my book, but I, I, the, my, my, the moment I remember with Johnny was, I said, I, I, he said, yeah, he goes, he goes, Robert, sir, like I decided to move out here to Hollywood because I was living in Miami and uh, it was March and I still left my Christmas tree up. I said, that was probably a good move, Johnny. And then cut to years and years later after Nightmare on Elm Street, somewhere in the late 90s, I was, I was killing time in a, a really cool Irish bar uh, in the Coronet Theater Pub on La Cienega in West Hollywood. And I had just done some big commercial interviews across the street and it was like 4.45 and there was no way I was gonna get on the freeway at, at 15 minutes to five in LA. That's like the rest of your life, you know. So you either get drunk, you go to a movie, you get, or you get a motel room. So I got drunk, and uh, I'm, I'm alone at the bar, and there's like some girls rehearsing, really beautiful actresses, and I look over in the corner, and it's Johnny Depp and someone like Eddie Vedder. Not Eddie Vedder, but someone like that. And Johnny's there, you know, with his cigarette, and he's very, and, he's, and, and he comes up and goes, Robert, I haven't seen you for a while. I go, Johnny, man, and he's upset. Now, I had just been to Europe, uh, for a, a publicity tour for another film, not a nightmare, not a nightmare film either, something else. Um, and Johnny had a huge hit over there. He was on buses and billboards, but he didn't know that. He just knew that the movie didn't do well in America. I can't remember what movie it was, but it didn't do well here. But it did great overseas. Dead Man, maybe I don't know. Yeah, something like that. And I said, Johnny, you know, I said, why don't you? Just, I said, you know, just jump on a plane, go over there. You're, I said, it's like huge over there right now. You, you, all your interviews are on the cover of all the French newspapers and the Italian newspapers, and you're on billboards, and you're on double-decker buses. And so, I, I don't know if he did, but the next thing I heard was he'd fallen in love and he'd moved to France, you know. And I think that was a good thing for him. I think that he needed to do that. But that's the last time I've ever run into Johnny, and I'm not taking, you know, credit for that. But I, it's that weird thing where you think we know everything, you know, this whole TMZ media thing. 
We don't know everything that's going on. I come to these conventions today, yesterday, I've seen at least a dozen things I've never seen before in my life. Today I saw a, a German press kit. Uh, I saw a, a phenomenal Spanish poster today that I've never seen before. And I just, I, I love seeing that stuff. I don't get to see that. You know, it's just really cool stuff. Plus all the new art that the dealers come up with, plus some of the stuff you guys do when you, the, those of you that really know how to Photoshop, you know, some stuff. I've seen some great stuff. Or Alamo, you know, posters and things like that that I haven't seen. So that's really fun for me. But uh, to answer your question, no, I don't think it's going to be, you know, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Johnny Depp, and Robert England in the row to Elm Street. <laughs> Next question. Oh, somebody far away. Uh, over here, this beautiful girl here with her arm up. You see, I see you. Hey, I see you, my little Freddie Ed. Shout. Okay, oh, I'm so proud of that movie. Thank you for mentioning it. I mentioned it earlier. You guys, Nathan Basil. How good is Nathan Basil in Behind the Mask? I saw Nathan Basil. I saw Nathan Basil play a Kurt Cobain groupie in a play at one of the best theaters in America. Oh, this guy is dangerous. I heard about him years ago from my agent and from people that saw him at Juilliard, you know. But Nathan's like dangerous. He's like two ways. There was a show, this is how sad it is for actors. Do you guys remember the show maybe four and a half, five and a half years ago? Invasion. Nathan Basil as the one-armed deputy sheriff redneck alien. Half alien, half man with Will Thick, Bill Thickner. This, was, this could have been a great show. I mean, how does how are our invasion and heroes and lost gone? Yeah. And we have Kim Kardashian. How does this happen in America? I just, I can't believe it. You know, anyway, long, it, so, so no. Here's the thing about Behind the Mask. You guys, the sequel script is extraordinary. They're making a movie about the mythology of, you know, of, of Behind the Mask, of Leslie Vernon. They're making a movie. And they're making, it's like a Hollywood horror movie. And we're all on location making this movie. And what happens is they call me and they call the girl from the original and they bring in her assistants, the, the sound man that she had and her cameraman, and they use us as technical advisors on the, the, the new Leslie Vernon Anchor Bay movie. And guess who else starts hanging out? Mm. And sooner or later, all the crew members start to die. The electrician gets electrocuted. One of the guys painting the scenery paints himself to death. You know, it's like Ten Little Indians. It's like an Agatha Christie movie. Well, obviously, it's Leslie. The actor playing Leslie is a method actor, and he wears the mask all the time. We never know who he is. So there's a guy playing me in the movie. There's a guy playing my character, Doc O'Halloran. There's a guy playing the girl. There's a guy playing her assistants. And then there, so we all sit around together in the motel, in the woods, talking. So we have our own doppelgangers. And one by one, the crew starts getting killed. And it's brilliant, you guys. But I think what happened is, Scotty Glosserman, our director, producer, creator, writer, I think Scotty knocked on doors so long, he got so close to raising all the money. But sometimes that last half a million is the most important. Because if you don't get that, you're not really making the movie you're supposed to make. And I think he just had a little bit of financing fatigue. And I think we're gonna get this movie made because it's a great, great sequel script. You guys, I'm telling you, I mean, you guys know how good the original script was. This script is even better. And, it, and, and, and instead of it turning into the hardcore sexy girl victim slasher movie, organically, we turn into Agatha Christie, 10 Little Indians on a movie set but everybody dies according to their job. You know, which I just think is a great gimmick. Okay, new question. In the back, one more in the back. I see somebody here. Yes. 
No, this young lady. <laughs> You're next, I promise you. Shout. Shout, shout. Yeah. Guys, I never know. You know, this is the weird thing. Uh, TV's so weird. Like, like yesterday, I got a call to do a cooking show in New York. You never know when, when, when stuff's gonna come up. And I have to go back. Uh, one of the things I'm going to be doing when I go back, and it's, it's not acting, but I gotta tell you, I've seen the storyboards and they're great. I am gonna be your new host on the Chiller Channel. Yeah! Wow. Hoping after, I'm hoping after the first series of things I do for them, I'm hoping that maybe I can, like, like maybe infect them with some choices for some films. The new Elvira. You know, movies Man. like May and movies like Brian De Palmer's Sisters. I want to do like Robert England, 11 o'clock Friday night double bills, you know? Yeah, so, because, I mean, I love stuff, I love old and new, you guys. I love old and new. And I like to blend that. And that's why I love coming here. And you guys, I just want to say, you know, there's an actor that, that Dave invited here. And, uh, and, and, and he's huge right now. And you guys love him from Walking Dead, Scott Wilson. Woo! But you guys, Scott Wilson, I, I wanted to be Scott Wilson in the 70s. And Scott, there's movies that Scott's done that are a little forgotten. You don't, no one forgets In Cold Blood. And no one forgets, you know, his great Gatsby. He was brilliant. But I know these dark little movies that Scott did like Lolly Madonna War Woo! and The Grissom Gang. And, and Scott's such an incredible actor. And I, I had a night, and Scott doesn't remember this, we were drinking tequila and smoking a little bit. <clears throat> and we were, we were in Topanga Canyon, and we were looking out over Santa Monica Bay, and Scott was sitting in an old oak mission rocker. And I was just, God, I was so grateful even to be on the deck with Scott Wilson. And I remember Scott started to do Hamlet. He did. Over to Rogan Peasant Slave Am I from Hamlet. And then I was talking to him later after another shot of tequila. And Scott was telling me about The Great Gatsby, and he was saying, you know, Robert, he goes, they, they heard part of my performance because I would do a scene, and they would put a hundred violins underneath it. It was like the London Philharmonic. And he gave me this advice about, you always have to be careful because you never know what kind of music they're gonna put under your performance. So this is me in 1974. 75 sitting next to Scott Wilson and he told me this he's like the best they never teach you that in acting class they never teach you that in drama 101 or some acting workshop you know in Cherry Hill or in Philly or in New York they never tell you that it's the best advice anybody's ever given me about how you have to fight against that you know that sentimentality and 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 you know Scott's just so amazing and I'm just so glad you know, for the huge, huge success of Walking Dead. And I try to tell Chad or Emily or Scott about this experience Nancy and I had. You know, every guy in the genre business, sooner or later you have to do your giant snake movie, your killer bee movie, or your giant alligator movie. Well, I've goddamn done all three. <laughs> so I'm in a car with a beautiful blonde Hitchcock, Elizabeth Rome from Law & Order. And the beautiful, which, 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 help me, which, which blade? Nancy Baller. Yeah. Nancy Baller. You know what I'm talking about, how hot is she? And we're driving in the back of an old car with a communist uh, a taxi driver into, into <laughs> Sofia, Bulgaria. We need pizza, we need a hot bath. We've been wrestling alligators for about six weeks. We're cold, the season has changed. And as we come into, Sofia, Bulgaria, with the gypsy, and I don't mean this with any kind of judgment or stereotype, but there's literally gypsy camps on either side of their only freeway. And now we're getting downtown and everything's getting better and the Soviets are gone and it's starting to get better. And there's a great pedestrian walkover, the, the freeway. The entire pedestrian walkover is more high tech than anything in the US. It's totally digital. This is three years ago. Totally digital. 
it's an, it's Blade Runner, and it's scenes from The Walking Dead. So that's what a hit The Walking Dead is. That's what I mean about international horror, science fiction, fantasy translating to international audiences. Three and a half years ago, in Bulgaria, there was a pedestrian crossover better than any sign on 42nd Street in Manhattan with scenes from The Walking Dead. It was already the number one show there. People living in a trailer the size of my shoe <laughs> were watching it with stolen electricity in a gypsy camp by the side of the road. So, Walking Dead is a player. Yes! <laughs> Zombies! Yes, sir. Well, you know, we never imagined, no one ever imagined that it would have become this international franchise. We knew we'd done something interesting. You know, Sean Cunningham did second unit on the original Nightmare. And you guys have to understand how beautiful how unbelievably beautiful Heather and Johnny were back then. And so I knew, because I'd been around the block, I knew that they were extraordinarily gorgeous, dewy, moist, lovely, <laughs> phenomenally. I mean, I, you guys like, I mean, Justin Bieber comes up to my knee. Johnny Depp's taller than me. I mean, these were real movie stars. You know, Heather looked like what you wanted Brooke Shields to look like. Brooke Shields is gorgeous, I know Brooke, but Brooke is tall, and for all of us guys, that's a little intimidating. Brooke's model height, Heather, Heather's a spinner. You guys know what I'm talking about. Hey, hey, all right. Come on, oh, I gotta laugh out of here. Right. You guys know what I'm saying, we all like that, you know, you, you know. And you know, you can, Heather can wear high heels and I can still dance with her, and, and, so beautiful and so smart and so talented, both of them. They couldn't make a mistake, so we knew we were onto something. Plus, Wes, brilliant. We loved Wes. Back then, Wes, you gotta understand, Wes was like David Lynch. The Hills Have Eyes, Last House on the Left. They were violent and dark, but they weren't quite Toby Hooper chainsaw. They were more David Lynch, uh, uh, leather, uh, not, what is it called, um, eraser head. So we, we you know, that, was, that was Wes back then. Ronnie had just been nominated for an Oscar for Nashville. We knew we were onto something, John Saxon. Here's a little parenthetical. Just so you know, like this is like weird bonuses to your career. Not money, not residuals, not surprise money or cartoon voices. I get to hang out with John Saxon. Dave's invited me here and John here. And Dave said goodnight to me in the bar downstairs here at nine o'clock at night. And I've gone out down the street here for Italian food with John Saxon and his beautiful lady and my wife. And John Saxon will open up to me. John Saxon starred with Robert Redford, not once, but twice. Electric Horseman and the, and the War Hunter. John Saxon starred with Marlon Brando in the Appaloosa. John Saxon starred with Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon. John Saxon starred for Quentin Tarantino on C CSI, on a two hour special uh, yeah. event CSI. John Saxon made love on camera to Audrey Hepburn in The Unforgiven and made Kurt Burt Lancaster jealous, directed by John Huston. John Saxon made love to Natalie Wood in Sandra Dion film. John Saxon made love to Francis Ford Coppola's first lover, Luana Anders, in low-budget films in the, in the 50s. John Saxon has touched everything. In, I mean, he is a connection. John Saxon and Henry Fonda are my connections to that Hollywood, to older Hollywood, to Betty Davis Hollywood. And then I get, and I can tell you guys that. And then you guys can tell people that. But that's the through line and the connection. And John Saxon knows stories about Vincent Price. He's, you know, it's this connection that you get. My makeup man worked on Betty Davis's last movie with 
did Betty Davis's makeup and spent eight weeks with Vincent Price on a beach in Maine and talked about me and told Vincent about me and asked Vincent all these questions. So I got my connection to Vincent, finally. And Vincent Price went out doing Wales of August with Betty Davis and the biggest star of silent screen, Lillian Gish, with my makeup man and talking about me at lunch. And I got that connection, I got that cook to that, you know, so I finally, because I didn't know Karloff, I know, I know Karloff's daughter, and I did a documentary on Karloff with his daughter, but that's how we get the through line. And years from now, there's gonna be great new stuff on cable and on network. And, 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 the, and those will be people that, and I'll be like the old man playing the old professor or something, and I'll tell them, and then they can tell stuff to your kids. You know, but that's how we get the truth and the legends of all this cool stuff that we all love, you guys, in my living room. And I try to keep my showbiz out of the living room, but I couldn't keep my 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea <laughs> original poster from Brussels, 1954, in the language of Jules Verne. I can't keep my Robbie the Robot original robot. You don't know what Forbidden Planet did to this cowboy. When I was a little baby and I saw that show at a matinee, oh my God, you guys. So I'm like you guys. I'm just a little more innocent because it wasn't quite as, as violent or nasty, although Horrors of the Black Museum was pretty hardcore. I remember the, the nails coming out of the binoculars when, that, when those were done. Ooh. And some of the hammer, some of the hammer was truly erotic. I mean, I remember, I remember I, w I had a girl's bra half unfastened at the drive-in movie, and I looked up at the screen and Barbara Steele was bleeding out of the corner of her mouth into her cleavage, and I, I kind of preferred that. Ooh, what's wrong with Robert England? No, but you guys, no, you know what I mean, you guys. We all know what I mean. Anyway, another question. Way in the back, the guy with a hat. Shout it out, you slacker MF. <laughs> no, you know, that was Wes. Wes wanted to send us all up and make us really a little different than who we really were because he wanted to make this point about Hollywood exploiting horror and you guys and loving you guys and borrowing from you guys and we know that you know what we're doing but we can still scare you. And, and he wanted to make a point about all of that. He, Wes was very successful then. And so that's not really me. That's an asshole version of me. Um, <laughs> I don't paint. I don't live in a huge Spanish Hollywood mansion. I live in a little funny bungalow in a very nice beach town, don't get me wrong. Uh, and I, but I'm three blocks from the beach with my dogs and my beautiful wife. But, you know, and I've lived there for a long time because of Freddie, but I did, I did collect photography for a while, so that's what Wes made the artist connection with. And Heather is married to a famous makeup man, but he never worked on any of Wes's movies. So that was a big, you know, extension there. But Heather did have some bizarre fan problems. So that was an early, you know, paparazzi, fan stalker thing that he was pursuing there. Um, and then the idea of what if we took a legend or a myth or a truth from the Incas or the Aztecs or the Egyptians or the Babylonians, what if we took something like that? You've all seen The Exorcist, the Zuzu, the very first image you see graven. What if one of those things we borrowed from, just one of, one of them really was real and really was evil incarnate, and we pissed it off. <laughs> so that's what we were doing with the new nightmare. That's really the, the kind of fun we were having. Uh, questions? I see somebody right here. What is your opinion on You guys, you heard me talk about the remakes. He wants to know about my opinion on the new nightmare. It's, it's that it was too soon. I love Clancy Brown, okay? I love Jackie Earl Haley. I love, um, who's, the, who's the great little actress from Social Network, help me. She's got a sister. I love, I love Rooney Mara. You know, girl with a dragon tattoo. 
I have kids that I've worked with in that movie. The boy from uh, Jennifer's Body. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I love him. He, he played my son in a movie with Brian Cox called Red. I, I love that cast. I think they tried too hard, and I think they, the reshoots that they packed up in the front, as good as that opening is, what it did was it made everybody in the movie already damaged by Freddy. You have to know, the, you have to meet these people before the damage has been done. So you can invest in them emotionally, then you see the damage that the myth, the legend, the story of Freddy does to them, or the haunting of Freddy does to them. They can't be haunted from the get-go, or you don't have anywhere to go with them, they just become damaged goods. So, and then they also, I think that movie just came out too soon. I think that movie came out two summers from now, or next summer, I, I think it would be a lot better received. I just think it was too soon. Now, another criticism I have, and it's taken me a long time to come up with this, and I worship the ground Jackie Earl Haley walks on, and I am happy and proud and honored to hand the baton to him. Jackie Earl Haley was in a movie I loved years ago called Breaking Away, about the bicycle racers. Jackie Earl Haley's the best thing in Watchmen. Jackie Earl Haley is brilliant in a cameo in Shutter Island. Um, fuck that Robocop, but anyway, but listen, Jackie, Jackie's, Jackie's a terrific actor, but the makeup on Jackie is photorealism. It's photorealism. And Freddy does not occupy reality. Freddy occupies the imagination of his potential victims. So in your imagination, we all exaggerate. We all use different fears and surrealism and imagination and our own personal things to define what Freddie might or might not look at. So whenever I, so the makeup that the Jackie was wearing is just a little too real for me. It's a little too photorealistic for me. Um, but that's only a criticism I have after seeing the movie a couple times and with some hindsight on it. It's a brilliant makeup, but Freddie's not documentary. Freddie's not documentary. Freddie's exaggerated. Freddie's a myth, and, and and I think you have to you have to play it that way. Freddie's not walking down the street, you know, doing nasty things to your kids. Freddie's a what if, and he's in your head, and he's in your subconscious, and he knows what's in your diary, and he knows what's in your underwear drawer, <laughs> and that's the most private places you have. So watch out for Freddie. Yes. Front row. How did you find out? How did you find the character? How did, I, how did I find the character? You guys have heard this story before. How did I find it? No, I was like, you know, I had some ideas and the makeup helped probably 70%. And I'm sitting in summer, Summer Olympics, LA. And I'm sitting in the uh, Lucy Desi, uh, Desi Lou makeup room in these old barber chairs. They're kind of pink, faded pink. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I've shot about two or three days, and I'm, I'm saying, I don't know if this is the right thing. I don't know, maybe I should have. It's like, I've been up at four in the morning, and they're basting me with KY jelly, and they're poking at me. Dave Miller, just come off a thriller, he's poking me with a really dry, crusty brush in my nose and my butt and my ears. <laughs> and uh, he, he doesn't have a great bedside manner, even though he's a genius. And I look over, and here's Heather Langenkamp the most beautiful girl in the world in this moment of time. And next to her is Johnny Depp, the handsomest man in the world at this time. They don't need makeup. They have no need for any glamor corrective makeup. They're both getting makeup. They're getting their eyelashes stretched. They're get and, and then they give them, Johnny and Heather, right next to me, they give them little fans, little portable fans to keep them cool in the summer in LA at the old Desilu Studios. And I'm sitting there, and I'm getting basted with KY jelly and Vaseline, you know, and I'm itchy and I'm wondering, did I do the right thing? And I look over and I envy them. I envy them both, their beauty, their youth, their entire careers in front of them. And I went, oh, Robert, you can use that. That's something, that's an acting trick. Your envy of Johnny and Heather 
can be your hatred of all these kids because Freddy hates youth and beauty. Freddy wants to stop it because Freddy never had that and never will. And that was the little accidental. I didn't prepare, I didn't do research, I didn't do my method exercises. That was the click for me. But I could turn that on right now. I can turn it on immediately because that moment is in me. That moment that I looked over at them, it's in me and I can just go there. So if I've got to throw Heather down on the ground for a second, or Johnny, you know, or any actor in one of those sequences, I can go to that. And it can just be, I wish I was young and beautiful again. You son of a bitch. And boom, <laughs> it's right there. Right. How many more questions, Dave? Uh, go and do two more. That yeah, two more. The second to the last. The penultimate question. The guy with the hat way over here. Oh no, it's Steven Spielberg. Stand up, sir. Oh, shit. <laughs> this guy's drunker than I am, you guys. Are we drinking? He was with me in the bar tonight. <laughs> Shout! You guys, voiceover work is the greatest gig in the world. The first paycheck sucks, but then you get, you know, you've heard trickle down. You've heard this theory of trickle down. The one place in the world where trickle down works is in voiceovers. You get, you get little checks forever, for the rest of your life. And you can show up in dirty underwear with, with, with tread marks and, 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 and you can be a hairball and you can have crap in your teeth and it doesn't matter. Here's the weird irony for me. Every time I do voiceover work, and I do a lot, every time I do it, and I work with stars and I work with the voiceover actors, but I work with Clancy Brown, I work with Mark Hamill, Susan Sullivan, lots of people you know. But every time I do it, there's a voice actor there doing the Irish cop or the police chief. He doesn't, they don't get the starring roles. Now, I'm not against celebrity voices. No one will ever be better than Billy Crystal in Monsters, Inc. And nobody will ever be better than John Goodman or Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres in Nemo. But I'm not really sure that Woolly Mammoth should sound like Ray Romano or Sabretooth Tiger should sound like Dennis Leary. And I love these actors. I, wor I love both of those actors. I love everything they've done, but I'm not sure if they're celebr I'm not sure anybody got in the car, hired a babysitty, babysitter, uh, put the four kids that could handle that movie in a car, filled the car up with gas, went out for Chuck E. Cheese, and went to see Ice Age to see Dennis Leary. They went to see the cartoon. Yes. And when I do cartoons, I work with guys, unknown to all of you, and we all know who Mel Blanc was. We know who the great voiceover guys were. I work with guys when I do voiceovers that are so facile and so quick and so brilliant and they do 90 accents and 15 voice placements in a second. I just did The Incredible Hulk a couple of weeks ago and I came in early and there was a girl and she was hot. She was beautiful. I think she does the voice for the girl with the glasses and Scooby-Doo. Velma. Velma. This girl was picking up the extra voices on this episode of The Incredible Hulk. And she was genius, brilliant. She did every line reading she did, I pissed my pants. I, she, made, she made a lot of faces, maybe that's why she's not that successful as an actress, but she was brilliant. I work with guys who can do the Irish cop they, then they do like a, a, a secondary villain. 
and then they do the voice of the, like the lava or something and they're brilliant and the moment the director says cut they improvise for 30 seconds and they're filthy dirty blue lenny bruce is fabulous these guys are so funny so smart beyond the groundlands beyond beyond snl beyond workaholics did you see my workaholics no but they're like they're they're so great you guys and here's the thing i get fr i always feel a little guilty you know because everybody in the room that's one of these voice actors is better than me now back 25 years ago these now these guys are making good money but they have to work every goddamn day of their life they drive from Culver City to Santa Monica to the Burbank every day picking up voices. You know, these guys should be the stars. They really should, they're that good. But we're into this celebrity culture now, so we don't get to hear the new Mel Blanc. There are guys that are so phenomenal, just like the old impressionists. When you were a kid, that you, when your parents were watching Johnny Carson or, the, or Jay Leno, you hear the old, the old impressionists. You don't see them anymore. These guys are like that. It's like a lost art. They're so good. Now, they don't feel sorry for them. They're making a good living, but they deserve to play some of the leads. They deserve to be the woolly mammoth. You know, if you want the New York, if you want the woolly mammoth to sound like a New York Jew then you should hire one of these guys. Because these guys, you should hear, they do 15 different kinds of New York Jewish guy, you know, or 15 kinds of New Jersey Italian, or 15 kinds of LA Valley girl. They're unbelievable. And so when I do cartoons, that's the one frustrating thing. Every time I drive home to Nancy, I'm always telling her about like some kid that was just off the charts brilliant, you know. Now, I just did Mutant Ninja Turtles, and one of the actors that I hired for my movie, uh, I, I did a family movie um, called Killer Pan. One of those kids is the star. I think he's Donatello. He's one of the turtles. But he's great. He's brilliant. And he always had this little bit, of, little bit of a metallic voice. And I think he may become one of these great voice stars. But he's also really cute. He's like the cutest skateboarder guy in the world. You know, that's what he looks like in real life. So I'm hoping that he can blend that. But he does have a really phenomenally interesting voice that's just made for this world of animation. And animation is getting so extraordinary. I hope we, we open the doors a little bit more to some of these unknown voice actors, because they are, you guys, you gotta trust me, they are great. There's some unbelievable talent sitting around, and they're working, they're just not doing the leads, you know. Uh, the last question. Robert! Yes, sir. Go. You got my attention, sir. Oh, no, uh-oh. This yes. Guy, this gentleman right here, this gentleman right here, whether all of you know, is one of the best, hey, hey. the best. If you have not seen Nightmare on Elm Street, the scariest, most freakiest, best horror, I don't even know, the words to use is amazing. And for all of you to be in the room of this man right now, you should all bow down on your knees and thank oh, him. Nobody should bow because I'm telling you right now, thank you very much. I want to thank you because you scared the crap out of me. And here's your microphone back. I know you want to have like someone else come here and ask questions, but no, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say this to everybody here. Um, I'm just going one more time. I'm going to pimp because I had a great year last year. 30th anniversary of Nightmare on Elm Street last year was my 40th anniversary as an actor. You guys. You will not be let down when you see Fair Clinic, and you will be not let down when you see the last showing. You can see the trailer, Film Company, that's P-H-I, like Phil, Film Company, uh, for last showing. I think when it's released here, it's gonna be called Midnight Movie. You guys, they're both good, I, good low-budget Robert England movies, and uh, I, I, I promise you won't be disappointed, okay? One's a thriller, one's horror. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm here all day tomorrow.